I'm here in Riga, um, where I live now a lot of the time, talking to VT Padmanabhan, who is an Indian geneticist who has worked with me uh, on the health effects of radiation for many years now, and he visited me in Aberystwyth long ago, and we've, we've collaborated on, on um, generally trying to tease out these the health effects of radiation. Uh, uh, in fact, he was he was working on this before I was. He worked he worked long ago with Rosalie Bertel. Um, he's come all the way here to Riga from India, and so we're very happy to have him. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Hiroshima study and a few other things. Um, well, first of all, perhaps you could just briefly tell me a little bit about your background, VT. Um, I understood you worked with with Rosalie Bertel for a while. Yeah. Even today, uh, after 60 years of bombing and nuclear technology, the nuclear establishment does not accept that the radiation which people are exposed to, the workers and the downwinders, can cause any genetic disorders. So you look at the uh, official reports of US National Academy of Sciences, you'll find that radiation-induced genetic disorders in humans have not been seen so far. It's ridiculous, you see. There are several people who claim that the children have been harm, harmed. There are certain people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who says that the children suffer from genetic disorders. So in 1957, the World Health Organization uh, deliberated on this issue and in, that, in a meeting they decided that this is a small beautiful place in Kerala, in the coastal region, where there is a huge deposit of monocyte, which is a thorium-bearing compound. So they said the air, people living there are exposed to an average of 600 millirad or 6 millisievert of radiation a year. And the, which is the, can, can about a tenth of the dose of the occupational, occupational dose of radiation workers. The logic of WHO experts was that if, to see if the, at this dose level, that is 5, 6 millisievert a year, that is 33, 180 millisievert throughout the reproductive span of the life. Does it cause any genetic effect in the children? So the Indian uh, Atomic Energy Department was supposed to have undertaken this study, which they did not. They set up a lab, but they did not do any epidemiological study or publish any paper on it. Now, we entered this area and saw that it's a place which has been untouched by other chemical pollutants or any of these things and there, there's comparable population living in north and south of this area. So we designed a study in which 38,000 people living in these beaches with high radiation was considered as the exposed population and another 32,000 people who were living in, in northern villages of this area where the background radiation was quite normal, were considered as the control. Dr. Rosalie Bertel and several other, Dr. Ali Stewart, uh, Carl Morgan and uh, Sadao Ichikawa, all these people were involved as advisors, and we had a lot of consultants from India also. A total of about 15 medical doctors participated in the diagnosis and we had done this study very systematically that all complex cases, diseases were shown to specialists, different specialists in respective fields. We did chromosome and genetic studies in, in, the, in the All India Institute of Medical Science Laboratory in Delhi. So it was a more or less complete study and was, uh, the finding was that the incidence of prevalence of chromosomal disorders, Down syndrome, is three and a half times higher among the exposed population. And there was also a statistically significant increase in single gene disorders. Like we found 18 single gene, different single gene disorders whose, whose occurrence is considered to be very rare in literature. In, normally, if you look at the radiation genetics literature, you, what you find is you find experts looking for one disease, like Marfan syndrome. Here we have a so lot of diseases which have been re uh, reported, including uh, sex chromosomes, uh, the sex recessive disorders. 
And these were associated with, with actual measurable chromosome damage, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what happened to the study then? I mean, if it showed such profound changes in areas of high radiation, surely it would have been something that should have been on the front page of Science or Nature. Yeah, it didn't come. It, it just published in International Journal for Health Services. But someone must have sent it to a big, big journal. Presumably, they they just rejected it. Is that right? Well, well what, what actually happened? Nothing you know? happened. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, that's extraordinary because it's normally assumed that, that, that natural background radiation studies show no effect. And clearly we see here that there is an effect right across the board with all these genetic uh, effects and also with associated with, with visible chromosome damage. Um, then you went on, uh, I, I recall, to, to work on the sex ratio uh, effects that were, in, that, that were found or not found originally, of course, in the Hiroshima uh, offspring. Perhaps you could tell us a little about that? <coughs> sex ratio was the first effect reported by geneticists from uh, atomic bomb, Kishkeswar, ABCC, Hiroshima. Yeah, the Hiroshima, yeah, the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. Commission. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there was a s small significant uh, increase in when the mothers were exposed to radiation. And I think it was blown up and in several newspapers and, and journals published this report. It was the first coming from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the, 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 that, that, that became, this sex ratio study becomes a major focus in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, uh, Perhaps before you go on, you could explain why, why sex ratio is important, how, how it can be affected by radiation, and what, why that suggests that there's a problem. Because I don't think people would understand that. The sex ratio is the number of boys born to the number of girls, <coughs> the number of girls born to the number of boys. Yeah. So why would radiation affect the sex ratio, briefly? See, we humans have 22 pairs of autosomes, known as chromosomes number 1 to 22, and one chromosome which is known as sex chromosome, it's X and Y. A female has 22 autosomes and one pair of X chromosomes, one derived from the father and the other derived from the mother. On the contrary, a male has 22 pairs of autosomes and one X chromosome derived from the mother and Y chromosome which came from the father. Now, if, the, if the, somebody is exposed to ionizing radiation or any other mutagen, the, if, if sperm cells are exposed to this, any mutagenic substances, we expect that the, uh, the damage to the chromosomes will be more or less uh, equal depending upon the size of the chromosomes. Now, if autosomes of mother or fathers are damaged, then its effect would be same. But if you, if X chromosome of the mother is damaged, uh, then the impact would be different in boys as well as the girls. Since the girls have two X chromosomes, if one of her X chromosomes derived from the father or mother is damaged, the fetus surveys and the girl also surveys. By the same time, if the X chromosome of a boy is damaged. There's no uh, second chromosome. There's no spare. To, yeah. to lay on. Mm. This way you find, you don't find sex linked recessive disorders in girls, like hemophilia. Mm. You don't find them in girls, only boys get it. Right. So the logic is that if the fathers were exposed and their, uh, their X chromosome received a, an insult, uh, then there would be no, g uh, g girls would not be born to them. At the same time, the, you know, if, if the father's uh, chromosome received an ex uh, recessive, uh, lethal recessive insult, there won't be effect on the girl child because the, the, the girl child of the fetus which is formed with that chromosome 
has got another uh, X chromosome derived mm. from the mother. Mm. At the same time, it was this mother's X chromosome which was damaged, had a recessive lethal mutation. Recessive lethal mutation. Then the boy born out of it will not survive. He will not come out to be aborted immediately after formation. Mm. Mm. So this this way this have had an effect on sex ratio. And sex ratio was the first effect uh, uh, discussed by the geneticists, radiation geneticists, and said that we could go to study about even before all these techniques of identifying and all these things were known. First thing is that you don't any this this kind of a study can be done by anybody. You don't need to be a doctor or a specialist. So you what all all what you need is a large number of birth data and to classify them boys, girls and then analyze it. So in the same way, in 1948, Neil and Schul also went there and they said, we we'll look into this effect. And the first paper showed that there's a small effect when the mother was exposed. And the, the study went on, went on and it went to, uh, earlier phase was 1948 to 64. And the data collection was not very, very accurate in the sense that they they got the reports from the uh, from the prefecture health authorities. So there's no uh, we can't say that the entire all the boys and girls born were born to hippocrates were documented. <coughs> the main issue in this is that. There were uh, uh, effects of exposure, or there were differences in the sex ratio of children born to various combinations, uh, which were hidden from the public. In the first paper they said there was, and then later on it was, the effect got diluted, diluted. And now the mainstream thinking is that the uh, ABC studies, studies by ABC and Radiation Effect Research Foundation did not reveal any genetic effect at all. Right. Well, it was not true. How they did they hit this was a crude method. You see, it is not done by scientists. It is done by you know primary school students. The, where they found that there was an effect really, they in, uh, added boys in 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 cohorts where there was a def deficiency of boys. They added boys and without, without explaining from the, where these boys came from. So what I did was I compared the data from the, in various different reports and look at the final report they, they published. You find huge numbers of children being brought in from nobody knows any, from where. So that there's a discrepancy between the total number of children in the later reports and yeah. in the earlier reports. Yeah, earlier. So they fiddled the data, we could yeah. say. We could say that was criminal, in fact. And it's published in a general science, you see. Right, right. So this is the same sort of cover-up that I found in the radium studies, right. where if yeah. they don't like the results, they just change the numbers. That's right. In the radium studies, they took out the, leuke <coughs> the extra leukemia cases in order to bring the relative risk down to what they thought it ought to be. Right. But then you went to, uh, ahead and did some studies uh, of, of the... Um, of the control groups, didn't you? That, that, that's what I recall for the working when you were bringing that paper to Lesvos for the ECRR. Yes. You studied the control groups and came to some conclusions about about the exposure of the control groups and how and how that had had, had altered the the picture with regard to sex ratio. Is that right? Yeah. See, in the control group, you had there, there are two control groups in Hiroshima analysis studies. One is the people who were living beyond f ten, five, five kilometers of the bomb uh, hypocenter. Uh, there were lo uh, communities living there before the bombing. And they are supposed to have received small doses, which at that time was estimated to be less than one red. And this was from external, was it? Yeah, this yeah. was external. And the other control group is a group called Norton City at the time of bombing, or NICATB. NIC consisted of two classes of people with two different histories of bomb exposure, bomb radiation exposure. One is those bo those young people who were outside the cities at the time of bombing, but were living in other cities of Japan, 
doing studies or working in industry so they came immediately as early as they could get back to their homes or cities and many of them participated in the rehabilitation work mm. and cleaning work or searching and there were another group which came much later uh, and most of this late late entrants were uh, japanese who were working in colonies like china and manchuria and all uh, expatriates so there's a uh, the, the nic in the life span study is about 25000 people in both cities out of this 25000 people 5000 people are known as not in city at the time of born early entrance early entrance yes e e n i c e e that's 5000 e e and yeah. this e e means people is defined as those individuals who entered the cities within 30 days of the bombing right now 5000 n i c e e and 20000 n i c late entrance And when would the late entrants most be? Late entrants could have come any time after the thirtieth day, right, okay. but most of them came after, say, about a year or two, yeah, and yeah. mostly some of them even came after 1950. And they needed to put those in in order to get the numbers up. Yeah, that, that right? was in order yeah. to get the numbers up. Yeah. They they brought in a lot of people who were not who came much later. So these are really quite different uh, cohorts, aren't they? In fact, yeah, they're, it's they're, not, not right to put them all in one lump. They're different in the sense the NICE were all residents of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were comparable to the people exposed there yeah. and who were uh, living there. The socio-economic status and health status of people who were expatriates were different, quite different from uh, the r- local residents. and this was debated earlier because there was an excess of some diseases like reproductive organ diseases among the expatriates all that and there was also a slight increase in in consanguinity marriage within blood relatives yeah. among the yeah. expatriates so there would be more with that you say that more more consanguinity amongst the expatriates Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make them more, more uh, susceptible right. to But of course the other difference is that the early entrants would have received more uh, residual radiation from fallout and rain out, isn't that right? No, earlier, earlier residents definitely did receive a lot of exposure, from the, mainly from the neutron activation products. Yeah.